The history of musical theater is vast, but when discussing which writers had a profound impact on the musical comedy genre, more often than not, the names are going to be the same. Stephen Schwartz, Stephen Sondheim, and Bono. Now, while their shows were fine, there was really only one writer and show that dared to stand in front of its audience and ask, Legacy, legacy, what is a legacy? No, not that one. When it premiered in 2007, the new Mel Brooks musical Young Frankenstein appeared to just be a ploy to cash in on the unprecedented success of the musical adaptation of The Producers, which it was, but this transition to the stage worked better than it had any right to. Instead of just being a quick cash grab on The Great White Way, the new Mel Brooks musical Young Frankenstein became a chance to examine the impact of a 70-year comedic legacy. So what does the new Mel Brooks musical Young Frankenstein say about Mel Brooks' style of comedy and why it was a perfect fit for Broadway? And does his approach towards retelling the story enhance or detract from the Frankenstein legacy? I'm Brendan from Wait in the Wings. And I'm Kate from Kate Cast Reviews. And this show calls for some therapy. Blazing Saddles in the early 1970s, Mel Brooks came across some ideas Gene Wilder had written on a yellow legal pad. Brooks affectionately asked, what the hell is that? And in that moment began their legendary collaboration. Later that night, they started brainstorming on Wilder's ideas about Frankenstein, and eventually, in the same year that Blazing Saddles released, the world was introduced to the story of Dr. Frederick Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. Sorry. In the film Young Frankenstein, Frederick is ashamed of his family's legacy and tries to distance himself from it as much as possible. Though that distance becomes difficult when he's called to Transylvania to take care of the family estate. While he's there, he reconnects with his inner Frankenstein and sets out to reanimate the dead. From there, hijinks ensue. The musical adaptation follows pretty much the exact same premise with some minor changes here and there. The film was a commercial success, and with this and Blazing Saddles being released in the same year, Year, this Brooklyn-bred comedian was officially a box office giant and a force to be reckoned with. Brooks would continue to flex his artistic and comedic muscles in film. That is, until he went back to where his career began and brought the producers to Broadway in 2001. The musical was met with critical praise, financial success, and swept the 55th Tony Awards. But we've already talked about all that before. The question here is, will lightning strike twice? Could Mel Brooks' signature style be reanimated on stage with his most recognizable story? Well, to answer the question of how we got here, my friend, we have to start from the beginning. Let's talk about Mel Brooks. More specifically, his style, and what makes his work so unique. Going all the way back to his work with Sid Caesar and Carl Reiner in the 1950s, it was evident that Mel Brooks was one of the first in a new generation of comedians. Following the Second World War, comedy became more topical in its presentation. Comedians like Bob Hope mixed current affairs with the rhythms of vaudeville. Brooks took this rhythm and flipped it on its head through comedic syncopation. Instead of following the conventional ebbs and flows of comedy, Brooks thrived by hitting the offbeats, mixing intellect with insanity. Brooks possessed an uncanny ability of highlighting the ridiculousness of history in a way that could only be done by someone with a scholar's level of understanding for the subjects. This can especially be seen in Young Frankenstein. While it would have been incredibly easy to make a rushed, low-quality parody of Mary Shelley's novel, the movie is instead a fitting tribute to the legendary film franchise surrounding Frankenstein and was written with a striking attention to detail. Both Brooks and Wilder knew that to make the comedy in the film work, they couldn't neglect the elements of horror that the story was based on. There are 
constant references to moments from the Universal movies. Visually, it's clear how Mel Brooks's young Frankenstein echoed James Whale's 1931 Frankenstein, the most obvious being that this was a black and white movie released in 1974, and the more subtle being the fact that the production borrowed lab props from the Universal films. Brooks and Wilder's attention to detail went even further than that though. Several passages from the original novel are quoted throughout the film, and there's even a reference to the tale of Prometheus, which inspired the story of Frankenstein. Brooks and Wilder clearly loved the story, and because of that, they were able to be truthful towards its roots while still relentlessly mocking it. And in referencing slash mocking those major beats from the story, Brooks was able to add in his own memorable moments too. What happened? Put the candle back. I am Frau Blucher. These moments and the over-the-top characters are a large part of what made Young Frankenstein an instant classic, and in many ways, what inadvertently made the material fit for the stage. When adapting films for the theater, certain elements need to be amplified, and more often than not, artists who usually work in a film medium are afraid to take things too far or make them too big. But not being able to take things too far has never been a problem for Mel Brooks. Brooks's style is so energetic and larger than life that more than anything, his stories can often feel trapped behind the silver screen. So with Young Frankenstein, once that screen was removed, the true scale of Brooks's ambitions and personality were able to become realized. The immaculate sets of the film transferred with ease in a set design that would make the haunted mansion jealous. And with the set in place and the freedom of a stage, the colossal melodramatic energy of young Frankenstein's characters was unleashed. Still, that doesn't mean that they became cheap caricatures. There's a careful balance that Brooks mastered where the character's actions may be farcical, but their motivations are deeply rooted in reality. Much like Brooks himself, the characters never come off as disingenuous or out of place. They're believable because, in essence, they're the products of the absurd and comical world they inhabit. Young Frankenstein was also met with the challenge of potentially being unfairly compared to its predecessor since the original film was such a hit. While that certainly did happen, more often than not, it could be said that Young Frankenstein's iconic status helped it. In a way, everyone was already in on the joke. Audiences would wait in anticipation for their favorite line to be performed live in front of them. One of the best things about seeing this show is hearing the reaction to when the putting on the Ritz bit kicks off especially when the monster joins in. It wasn't easy for the musical to live up to such a remarkable film, but thankfully, in true Mel Brooks fashion, the musical featured a very solid cast and borrowed many of the creative talents that made the producers a success, including producer's cast member Roger Bart, starring as the titular Dr. Frankenstein. But more than anything, Brooks set out to do what he always did, put on a great show where the audience could have a good time. And that had always been Mel Brooks' approach to storytelling. He never wanted to go for a little laugh from the audience. Mel's goal was to make people fall on the floor, which makes his initial decision to tackle Frankenstein even more bewildering. At face value, the cautionary tale of a man deciding to play God by robbing people's graves and stealing bootleg brains wouldn't be the most attractive prospect to turn into a comedy, let alone a musical. But beyond the skeletal outline of the story, Brooks could see a profoundly human element that was often overlooked in the story's retelling. Love triumphing over fear. A love that is carried over, not just in how respectful this story is to what came before it, but also how it transforms Mary Shelley's classic novel. Here's the thing about the novel. The original story of Frankenstein is a cautionary tale about a young man who attempts to defy nature and runs from the consequences that came along with his creation. The 
story is Victor constantly dodging responsibility for what he's done and as a result, his creation and his loved ones suffer. Even the Universal movies, as much as they deviate from the original material, still carry this theme, as does Peter Cushing's or Kenneth Branagh's or James McAvoy's. All these tales of Dr. Frankenstein's and their monsters share this trait. Even Hunter Foster's Frankenstein in Frankenstein A New Musical, which was running on Broadway at the same time as young Frankenstein, is a character who lacks accountability for his creation until it's too late. The tragedy remains intact in every version except for young Frankenstein. His name alone signifies that Frederick Frankenstein is embarrassed by his family's legacy. However, when he arrives in Transylvania and after an elaborate song and dance dream sequence, he begins to continue carrying on his grandfather's work. That formulaic retelling of the Frankenstein story is very prevalent in the ending of the 1931 film, which ends like every other monster flick of the time. The 1939 film Son of Frankenstein found Wolf von Frankenstein in an identical situation to Frederick Frankenstein. And I wish I could find a way to add a few more Frankensteins into that sentence. Wolf begins as level-headed and dismissive of the authenticity of his father's work, only to eventually have that Frankenstein curse begin to take over. There's no denying that there's just something in the blood of this family that compels them to partake in experiments like this. It was true for Victor, it was true for Wolf, and in Young Frankenstein, it seems that it's going to be true for Frederick. However, with Frederick, when things went wrong and his creation turned out to be yet another monster, he didn't seek to destroy that monster. Instead, he took responsibility. He didn't abandon his creation when things got difficult. He sought out to improve the life of his invention, even at the cost of his own, which in turn allowed the monster to have a chance at living a fulfilling life. Unlike the original Abomination, who was shunned by anyone who looked at him, this monster, through Frederick's efforts, was given the chance to live happily as his own man who could become intelligent, gain full articulation, and even fall in love. Fall in love with his creator's fiance, but Frederick's got another girl now, so he doesn't seem to mind. The musical was able to take those elements and highlight them through songs that added more grandiose to these emotional themes. And like with the producers, Mel Brooks took this chance at retelling the story to polish up the ending a bit. The ending of the original Young Frankenstein is probably one of the better of Mel Brooks' early films. But much like those old Universal monster flicks, it can still come off as abrupt. In the musical, however, after the mind transference, Frederick is instead captured by the villagers and hanged for his crimes. But then the monster bursts in, begins talking like Noel Coward, and heals Frederick's injuries caused by that hanging. The monster brings Frederick back to life in one of the most poetic, full circle endings the Frankenstein mythology has ever seen. This ending in the musical is as fitting as it is touching. When originally conceiving Young Frankenstein, Gene Wilder wanted to give the story a happy ending. This not only achieved that, but did so in a way that made the ending feel earned. The monster got the happy ending that his predecessor was denied, and Frederick was not only able to truly accept his title as a Frankenstein, but also erase the shame of his family name by successfully achieving what Victor set out to do. Young Frankenstein, much like the original 1818 novel, is about a lot of things. But the main driving force of this musical adaptation are love and legacy. The benefits of retelling a story that has been told countless times for almost 200 years is that in the right hands, there could be new avenues and themes to explore. And in echoing that experience, 30 years after Brooks brought Young Frankenstein to life, he was able to reshape it to fit a medium he had grown to love. A medium that he might not have discovered his love for if it wasn't for the love of his life. Anne Bancroft saw what her husband was capable of as a songwriter, and after she compelled him to write a song for The Twelve Chairs, almost every Mel Brooks movie came with an original song composed and written by Brooks. Young Frankenstein premiered on Broadway in 2007, two years after Anne Bancroft had passed away. But through this musical, Mel Brooks kept alive the talent she saw in him and was able to honor both his love for her and the legacy of Shelley's original novel. 
In the end, though it may not have achieved the same commercial or critical success of the producers, Young Frankenstein still deserves a place in the mythos of Broadway for continuing the trend of creating theater that is unashamed in indulging an audience's desire to just have fun. Much like Evil Dead the Musical, Young Frankenstein wasn't created to flip Broadway on its head, but rather was intended to be a love letter to a film that generations of movie lovers revered and longed to be a part of. One of the most dynamic elements of live theater is that it's an embodied communal experience for everyone involved. And this Mel Brooks signature comedy style fits live theater so well because he respects his audience's intelligence while also allowing them to be in on the joke. With a comedic icon as over the top and theatrical as Brooks is, it only makes sense that his style of storytelling and his uninhibited characters would serve to be enhanced by jumping over to the stage. Because sometimes a show doesn't need to captivate you dramatically or move you to the point of existential enlightenment. Sometimes it's just nice to escape into the Abbey normal. 